healthy. I came for the sick and the broken and the sinners. And oh, by the way, who among you does not fit into that category? Oh, religious leader. So Jesus tells them metaphorically, I came to heal the spiritually sick. Read the chapter. That was his response. Matthew and others like him had a sin a sickness called sin that kept them separated from God. And Jesus' mission was to remove that obstacle and bring a reconciliation between God and man. So this obviously has eternal implications. So one of the components of what it means to surrender as a follower of Jesus is to surrender our eternity, our eternal lives to him. But it also means that we surrender our earthly lives to him. Notice again what happens. Jesus says, Matthew, follow me. And what does he do? He gets up and he leaves. He physically follows Jesus. He's saying to Matthew, I want you to leave the life that you've always known. That place of familiarity where you have connected with a whole set of values and a whole lifestyle. Luke, in his description of this story, uses much stronger terminology. This is what Luke says. He says, In leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Matthew was, leaving, was willing to leave it all. Church, don't be fooled into thinking that being a follower of Jesus is just about surrendering your life in the there and the after. On the contrary, it's just as much about us surrendering our life in the here and the now. You know, what are we surrendering? What are we, we giving up? See, it's not a matter of either or, it's a matter of both and the word and. Both and, not either or. He wants the future and he wants the present. Now, you may not be called into full-time ministry or to be a full-time disciple as is defined in the Gospels, but you are called to be a follower. And that involves surrendering and obeying. And what it means practically for us today in our culture is it means that we're willing to surrender our ego and our pride and our way of life that includes all the habits, all the addictions, all of the attitudes, all of the values that we've embraced, and all of our definitions of success that bring complexity into our lives, that bring brokenness and confusion, and we're willing to walk away from those things and allow Jesus to, to breathe into us a new set of values, a new set of attitudes, a new set of, 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 of thoughts and ways of acting and reacting that would be defined by his kingdom, the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. Church, how many of you know it's a better deal to have love, joy, and peace than it will ever be to have hatred and depression and fear and anxiety? Because that's what Jesus offers when he says, come and follow me. Because he said, you know what? Your yoke is a tremendous burden that weighs you down and breaks you and wears you out. But he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because the kingdom emotions in my kingdom bring freedom and liberty, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control against such. Paul said in the book of Galatians, there is no law. It will renew you, it will refresh you, it will liberate you, it will move you from complexity to simplicity. So I want you to rate yourself on these marks as we go along. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being, well, I'm not doing real well on the surrender issue, and 10, I'm, I've, I've made incredible progress, just pick a number. And I want you to write that down in your notes if, you're, if you've got uh, a pen and you're taking notes this morning. Just on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you on the surrender scale? Mark number two is sacrifice. That's the second mark of a follower of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 28, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me or to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Which speaks to us of the whole issue of self-denial. The doctrine of self-denial. Denial, which is so intertwined in what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It means that we carry the example of the cross of Jesus into everything that we do as Christians. And there is no more powerful picture of that in Scripture for us than Jesus agonizing in the garden. As we come through the Holy Week, I want you to to leave with a vision of 
not only Christ resurrected in an empty tomb, but I want you to leave with a vision of Jesus agonizing in the garden. Because that picture speaks to you and I of the power of self-denial. Of you and I denying ourselves in order to pick up the cross and truly follow Christ in the context of our culture. See, this word has to be contextualized from generation to generation and from culture to culture. So as you and I grow together in a community of faith, we learn to understand what that ought to look like in our culture, in our day. He calls us to contextualize the word in our journey. And it's not just an issue of the vertical, but church, it's an issue of the horizontal. What does self-denial look like? Not just in our relationship with God, but in our relationship with others. What does that look like in your marriage? What does that look like in relationship with your children, your neighbors, the people you work with? See, I think in a practical sense, it, it looks like you and I giving up our rights. The right to have our needs always met. Husbands and wives, you don't always have to have your need met. Every time there's a social event in the family, every time money is spent, you don't always have to have your needs met every time there's a family outing. We're talking about giving up our rights in order to meet the needs and desires of others, not just ourselves. Isn't that how Christianity is defined? God moves us from being self-centered to other-centered. And when you begin to allow that attitude, didn't Bob preach about that in the beginning of our series? Let this attitude, book of Philippians, be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Jesus was willing to give up his rights. As the prince of the universe, he had a right to live a full, rich life on planet Earth. Jesus was willing to allow that to be cut short so that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly in the there and the after. He was willing to lay it down. What do we call that? We call that self-denial. How do you rate on self-denial on a scale of 1 to 10? Number three, the word sustain. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the... Regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And what's interesting about this passage is that Christ is responding to a question, a statement of Peter after his encounter with the rich young ruler. And if you remember when Jesus encountered the rich young ruler, he said to the rich young, young ruler that the only thing that you've got missing in your life is that you need to sell, if you want to follow me, is to sell all that you have and then come after me. If you remember the story, he went away really saddened because he had a lot of wealth and he was just not ready to part with that wealth. Peter said, Lord, we're willing to surrender everything for your sake. In fact, we've done that. We've left all. And Jesus responds with the words we just read. And here's what I want you to notice about those words, that not all of the 12 that were present at the time Jesus spoke those words will rule with him in eternity. Because one of them was a fraud. One of them betrayed him. See, going the distance, church, has its rewards. Jesus said that those who follow me and will go the distance, will rule with me, and will be rewarded in eternity. And evidently, one of the followers had not truly surrendered. Thus, he had no staying power. What are we talking about? We're talking about the marks of a follower. See, followers don't just start the race. They finish the race. They understand what it means to go the distance. In order to rule and be rewarded, you have to endure all the seasons of life and life's journey to hear Jesus say, well done, thy good and thy faithful servant. How many of you want to hear that when you come into eternity? Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse when he's talking about 
the end times. He also said in that same response to the questions the disciples asked him about the end of the age, he said, it's he that endures to the end that shall be saved. In other words, starting is just not enough. Having staying power to endure the ups and the downs, the mountaintops, the valleys, the brokenness, the misfortune, the tragic mistakes we make that complicate our lives and we endure to the end. Jesus said, then you will rule and you will reign with me. Rate yourself on your staying power on a scale of one to ten. What are we talking about? We're talking about the sustainability of our commitment to Jesus. It's not a one-time commitment. It is an ongoing commitment. So when things don't go our way and things don't work out the way we expected and there's brokenness and misfortune, do we walk away? Do we take our hand out of his hand or do we tighten our grip? And we trust him. Number four is share. Matthew 4, 19, he said to them, he's talking now to the disciples collectively, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. John Piper observed that when he demands that we follow him, he means that we join him in the task of gathering. There are no neutral followers. We either scatter by the way we live our lives or we gather. Following Jesus means continuing the work he came to do, gathering a people in allegiance to him for the glory of his fathers. And there's two words that capture this mark for us. It's the word invite and the word invest. You know, as Joe shared this morning about we've got a mission field here, we have got so many friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors that we're connected to that need Christ. We've got to be willing to wade in here at home as much as we do on the foreign field. That starts with your family. God is a God of household salvation. Don't minimize your ability to to influence. So Easter's coming, and we've got an incredible week of services. Who are you going to invite? I want to challenge every one of you to invite at least five people to one of those services or to a men's or a women's event, a marriage weekend. What great opportunities you have to invite the power of the Ask Church. Why? Because you have influence. You've got the Spirit of God in your life You've got relationships. You've got circles of people you're connected to. Who are you bringing along with you? Every one of our empty seats here reminds us that we're not done yet. We've not adequately filled the house. And Jesus is not coming back until, the scripture says, his house is full. He will yet tarry until you and I have gathered and invited. Who are you asking? Who are you inviting to come along with you in the journey. And akin to that is the word invest. Because that's what disciples do. See, he didn't say, I want you to go out and to, to make invitations and to, to win commitments. He said, I want you to make disciples. And disciples are only made when somebody invests in their lives, like we saw in our video this morning. There was an investment that was made in that young man's life. There was energy and time being invested so that he would be able to become a reproducing member of the body of Christ as a disciple who would invest in others. So, you know, there's a book that came out recently, not too long ago. It's really a powerful tool for investment. I want to encourage you to consider this. It's called The Stranger on the Road to Emmaus by John Cross. Great tool for what we call investment. The stranger on the road to Emmaus, it it kind of plays off of the story in the Gospel of John when Jesus, after he rose from the dead, is walking along the road to Emmaus and two disciples are are walking along as well and they begin to talk to Jesus. They don't recognize and see that it's Jesus. And they begin to talk about all that was happening around the events of the Holy Week and how this Jesus died and said that he he would rise from the dead and they don't know that it's Jesus. And Jesus begins to expound on the entire highlight of the Old Testament, of, of what the Old Testament spoke about the coming of the Messiah and his death and his resurrection. He expounds on the scripture for them. By the time they get to Emmaus, they're so touched in their hearts by what he has shared. They said, why don't you stay with us? Let's, 
We want you to stay overnight and we'll have dinner together. And he does, and as, as they share a meal together, he breaks bread, the scripture says. Their eyes are open, they recognize it's Jesus, and he vanishes from their midst. It's the whole idea of how Jesus affects us in the depths of our soul. And so what's happening is that churches are, and Christians are, are doing this across uh, America, and really globally, because it's happening over in China, is that what they're doing is they're taking this book and they're just one person, one Christian takes another person, either uh, a seeker, a new Christian, somebody that needs to be discipled in the faith, and they take this book and they make a commitment to meet with that person, just one person. What would happen at Word of Grace if every one of you just took one person and you took this book and you sit down with them? It could be in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, at lunch, dinner, whatever. One time a week we are going to meet for the next six to nine months. And you know what you do? You just read through the chapter together. One chapter takes like seven minutes because what's in the book is transformational in terms of what it speaks about the life ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It takes you through the Old and the New Testament highlights of, of his life and his ministry. It'll impart discipleship principles. What would happen if we not only invited but invested our lives? And we're not asking for like a really big commitment, just one person. Some of you can think right off the top of your head, who's that person that keeps popping up in your life that you've been ministering to and you've been talking to and they keep coming across your path? That's your disciple. If each one of us had our hand connected to a, a Paul in our life, somebody who's more spiritually mature and somebody who's seeking, who's less spiritually mature than us, the exponential growth of the church explodes. How many of you would be willing to consider doing that in the next year? Put your hand up real high. We're going to have these books available through Easter, Holy Week, and see what God does in our journey. What are we talking about? We're talking about sharing, and akin to that is the last mark, and then we're going to close in prayer, and that's the word shine. Sharing and shining, they go hand in hand. Because the fifth mark is found in the context of a metaphor that Jesus used often that we find in the New Testament, and that's the metaphor of light and darkness. Speaking of the kingdom of, of Satan and the kingdom of God, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world, talking to his disciples. Do you know what he says on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 about you and I? He said, you are also the light of the world. He said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Where is your light shining? What are we talking about? We are talking about your reaching potential. We're talking about your influence, your witness. 1984, I graduated from 